in our previous lessons, we have investigated different properties of water so that we could better understand how water is essential in keeping organisms alive on our planet. Today, we're going to look at how water is used and abused by South Africans. We will also take a look at the water legislation so you know your rights and responsibilities when it comes to the use and protection of fresh water. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe where water is found in South Africa and how we use water, conduct an investigation into the use of water and evaluate ways to conserve water. As we all know by now, water is a precious resource. It is an amazing and unique compound and we would not be able to live without it. We also know that water cycles around our planet. It cannot be created, so we can only use what we already have on Earth. This means that there is a limited supply. But many people abuse it because they take it for granted that it will always be available. Do you do that at home? If you are lucky enough to have water coming into your house, then someone is paying for that privilege. I want you to think about a few issues at this point. What are we paying for when water comes into our houses? Can we own water? If you have running water, what happens when it is cut off at your house for some reason? How do you feel? Perhaps you'd like to discuss these questions in small groups. Water is a natural resource and we all have a right to clean water to drink so that we can stay healthy. The minimum amount of water required per person per day is 25 litres. Let's take a look at where most of South Africa's water is and get an idea of how much we really have. In South Africa, we have a wealth of mineral resources such as coal, gold, platinum and iron, but we do not have a large amount of water. Our average rainfall is less than 470 millimetres per year, which is only this much. Some parts of our country receive more than this average, but many receive less. Look at this map of South Africa. All the places to the east and south of this line receive more than 400 millimeters of rain each year and all places to the west receive less. So our country is roughly divided into a wetter eastern half and a drier western half. There are some areas that are much wetter than others. These places here on the east coast along the mountains and in the southwestern Cape receive over a thousand millimeters of rain per year but many parts of the country are very dry. In this whole area only between a hundred and two hundred millimeters of rain fall each year and here the annual rainfall is as low as a hundred millimeters. Our country is hot and dry, so much of the rain that does fall evaporates very quickly and rain does not always fall where it is needed. So, big dams have been built that collect about half of South Africa's annual rainfall. We have 550 government dams in South Africa. They have been built in areas of higher rainfall. Water can then be transported away from these dams to areas where water is scarce. Dams affect the environment in positive and negative ways. Have a look at this table of information of some of the impact that dams can have. The benefits of dams are that they allow water to be directed to many areas of the country and into homes. They also regulate the flow of a river to reduce flood damage. Water plants grow in sediments formed at the bottom of dams and remove chemicals from the water. Some of the negative impacts are that the amount of water is reduced in rivers below the dam and they do not flow as strongly as they could. Rivers can also stop altogether, destroying the animal and plant life that relies on the river. 
most dams are shallow with a huge surface area, which means that a lot of evaporation occurs. This graphic shows all the major rivers on our map of South Africa. I want you to look at where you live and take note of the major river and dam closest to you. Lastly, let's consider groundwater. This accounts for 30% of the water we use overall in South Africa. So, groundwater is a very important source of water, especially for communities that live far from rivers. So, what do we use water for? Well, perhaps you thought of these uses of water for doing laundry, dishes, toilet flushing, drinking and cooking, bathing and gardening. If we look at this pie chart, we see that these things use up only 17,8% of the total water use in our country. In our country, a lot of our water is used for the irrigation of crops. This accounts for 60,6% .6 of the total water used. About 2,7% is used by animals on farms and in game reserves. The rest of our water is used in industry. Water is used in many important industrial processes. 4,3% of our water is used in generating electricity. 3,3% is used in mining and 11,3% is used by different industries. After water has been used in industrial chemical processes, it is often not clean and cannot be used for human or animal consumption. But the National Water Act says that we all have a basic human right to clean water. At present, South Africans obtain water in many different ways, from rivers or streams, from yard tanks or taps, from a communal standpipe, from a paying kiosk, from a public tanker, from a water vendor, or it may be piped into our houses. Not all of these are sources of clean water. There are many projects in place to ensure that this basic right of all South Africans will be met in the future. The National Water Act, drawn up by the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry, is very important for our country and it is important that as a citizen you understand its meaning. We not only have a right to clean water, but we also have responsibilities. In a simplified form, the Act says that we must use water carefully and not waste it so it will be there for us and future generations. We must have respect for water and all life. We must conserve water and thereby conserve the natural environment. We must not pollute rivers with liquid and solid waste. We must take action to solve any water problems. We must pay for water services. So, what is this saying to us? Why don't you have a class discussion about what you think this legislation means to us? Basically, good water management is good sense. If we don't look after and care for our water resources, then it is only us who will suffer. The San people, indigenous to South Africa, recognized this. They understood water as something so precious that it formed a very important part of their religious lives. They saw it as a medium through which they could enter the spirit world and talk to God. They depicted their rituals and beliefs as rock art. One of the most famous examples of South African rock art, the Linton panel that is preserved in the South African Museum in Cape Town, shows some of their water-related rituals. This picture shows figures in a trance undergoing changes in order to be able to make rain. For the San, healing took place through the medium of water, and they believed that by entering into a trance, they could approach the rain animals and make rain. Do you think we use water as wisely as the sand did? Well, the problem with modern societies is that we do not see how we, as humans, are part of the water cycle. It seems that we have lost respect for this wonderful resource. Let's investigate how humans pollute water so that we can become more aware of our role in this. There are two main groups of pollution. Bacteria that cause diseases such as cholera and typhoid, and chemicals. 
Disease-causing bacteria in water make people and animals sick and spread easily when people drink polluted water. There are strategies that can be used to kill the bacteria in the water before it is drunk. As far as chemicals are concerned, these come from industries as waste products. These wastes may be released directly into rivers or may seep down into groundwater. Some examples of these waste chemicals are heavy metals such as nickel, zinc and lead from mines, oil, petrol and diesel from underground tanks at petrol depots, chlorine and detergents from paper mills and textile factories. Insecticides and fungicides that have been sprayed onto crops can be washed into rivers and will poison the organisms living there. The other types of chemicals that can pollute come from litter, fertilizers and sewage. Fertilizers can wash into rivers from farmlands. Human sewage can be placed directly into rivers or can seep into the groundwater from rural toilets if they are not properly maintained. Both fertilizers and sewage contain nitrates and phosphates which are very soluble in water. Plants use these ions for growth and so an excess of these ions in a body of water can cause too much plant growth which can prevent natural water flow or block out sunlight in the water below. It also changes the ecology of the water. If there are more plants, then there will be an increase in the organisms that feed on these plants and the balance of the ecosystem in the water body will change. So, how can water be cleaned so that it is safe to use? We are now going to hear from a representative from WaterWise at Rand Water about how water purification takes place at a water plant. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm at Rand Water to find out how they purify water here. But first, let's chat to June Lotz, who will tell us more about the first step in this process. The first step of purification, call it coagulation, and this is slaked lime that we add to the water to make the dirt particles cling together. We burn the raw limestone, it becomes calcium oxide, then we add water to it, just crush it and then add water to it, and that becomes calcium hydroxide looking like this. Here the slaked lime is added to the water, that is called coagulation. Then what happens is the water gets spun around these spiral flocculators at high speed, and the dirt molecules start sticking together. The water with the flocculate is pumped into these huge sedimentation tanks. The flux settles to the bottom and the clean water at the surface is drained off and sent to the carbonation base. This is where carbon dioxide is added to the water, just like the fizziness in your soft drinks, and that makes the water taste a whole lot better. Filtration takes place inside this huge building. These are all enormous sand filters where the water slowly drains through the sand and any remaining dirt or flock is removed. The final stage of the water purification process is where they inject chlorine into the water to kill any bacteria. That way your water remains fresh by the time it reaches the tap in your home. I hope you learnt as much as I did. Now let's go back to Nelly in the studio. I'm sure you have learned a couple of things you didn't know from that insert. Now, let's have a look at your task for today. Conduct an investigation to find out how much water you use in a day and then draw up a plan to find ways to conserve water. I suggest that you do this investigation over three to five days. Every time you use water in any way, write down how you used it and estimate how much you used. Don't forget the small stuff. For example, if you drink a glass of cold drink, you need to count the volume of the drink because most of it is water. You will then be able to calculate your average for a day. Next, write a list or create a concept map showing how you and your family could conserve water at home. In the next lesson, we are going to look closer at the atmosphere and investigate how it is linked to the hydrosphere. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.